Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the quasi-periodic astronomy podcast where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the hosts are physically separated. Aww. We are Strange Charm and Top the Astro Quarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addie Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from slightly north of the Tropic of Cancer. Our stumpers <laughs> today are physico-directionally, sort of. <laughs> None of Whatever that. Is. Well, well, we'll see how you do with it, Jim. So we'll start with you. It's a real quandary: up or down? Wow, that is a that is a challenge. It's it's a more profound question than it might seem. Yeah. On its surface. Uh. Hmm. Or is it? I'm gonna get real weird with it. And uh, I was <laughs> counting on that. Yes, that's exactly what I was counting on. <laughs> I'm gonna get weird with it and go down for the following reason I prefer a left handed universe. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is very for, for the math nerds among you. When you set up a, a coordinate system, you get your x and your y and your z, and and when you do the when you do the right hand rule and you, you go from the x to the y, you end up with the z going up. But I, With your right uh, hand, your your Z is the right thumb. Your Z is your right thumb, like, and that's up. Yeah. And I like it down. Uh, okay. Down. What? So where does the left-handedness come in from that? Because because you use left hand. Up and uh, when I first learned physics, I was screw up because I do the right hand rule. Except I do the left hand rule because I'm left handed, and I just naturally start doing that, and I always get the answer wrong. And so when the answer was supposed to be up, it was down. You know, it's right for electrons. Okay. And, and so anyway, I'm going okay. down because I was always wrong and I, I have a chip on my shoulder. I see. Okay, uh, interesting. It doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> what was I supposed to do with Wow. <laughs> I thought you might go up and down quarks. I thought so too. Yeah. But it's too I, predictable. I, I, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, let's see, Addy, what can you do with this one? Positive or negative? Um... <laughs> uh, I thought it would, I, th I thought about doing north or south. Would you prefer north mm. or south? Positive or negative? Let's see. We can talk about charging. We can talk about polarity. Um, I'm going to go with uh, negative. Oh, not boy. because not just because I'm in a particularly negative mood today, um, but because a lot of what I study tends to be negatively charged stuff. Okay. Um, dealing with like electrons and I like how it's not just because you're in a particularly negative mood that's like <laughs> that's happening but that's not the only reason why you're going no. with negative yeah I could still be swayed to positive even if I was in a terrible mood but yeah not today okay down and negative boy well we'll try to be a little mm. bit more upbeat for the rest of the show <laughs> the uplifting yeah. astronomy podcast we'll, yeah. But yeah we'll Have try fun, to be your listener <laughs> yeah. yes it's the downbeat negative astronomy <laughs> podcast today we'll talk about the sun now beginning its next solar cycle its number of sunspots is ticking up and Same. the structure of the universe as well as a lot of space news but first this episode of walk about the galaxy is brought to you by sunspots Troubled by the appearance of spots on aging skin, rather than applying costly cover-ups, take your cue from sunspots and embrace a new cycle in your life. That spotty darkening signals maturity, wisdom, and a strong magnetic field that inhibits convective heat transport to the photosphere, resulting in slightly lower temperatures and a darker appearance against a radiant background. Coming and going every 11 years, sunspots on the source of all energy and life on Earth remind us that a little spot or one that is over 100,000 kilometers across is part of the natural cycle of stellar life. Sunspots, the future's bright, the future's orange. Yeah, sunspots get a, a bad rep as being dark, but they're really, really bright. They're just... Not uh, as bright. Not as bright. Yeah. The future is orange? The future's bright, the future's orange. Is that, is that a real, real tagline? It that. is a real tagline. And our, I'll give you a hint, our overseas listeners are like going, well, that's obvious. Oh, I was some of our Florida Gators, but that's no, not gonna do it. some tang. of our overseas listeners are going, Tang. Oh, I love Tang. No. That's my favorite hot beverage. Sunny D. For that, but, uh. <laughs> 
No, it's actually, are you ready for this? Orange. Oh. What? Orange. <laughs> <laughs> orange, orange is a pretty major, um, like, uh, mobile telecom uh, ah. unit in Europe. It was originally oh. uh, established in the 90s in the UK. It was purchased by France Telecom. And uh, when, you're, when you're in Europe, you see, you go into... It's like going into a Sprint store here. You go into an orange and you get a, your SIM card changed for your U.S. phone or whatever. So, I don't know. Sunspots, the future's bright, the future's orange. And sunspots yeah. are slightly orange-ish compared to the rest of the sun, right? A little mm -hmm. cooler, yeah, a, little sure. bit, a little bit redder than the rest of the sun. Hey, here's sure. a random question for you guys. Great. Um, if you take the, the peak wavelength of the sun's spectrum, like the, the wavelength where the sun is the brightest and you just look that up on like a prism mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. it's, you know what color it is? It's green. It's green. Yep. So what's up with that? That's the, that's the, <laughs> other, <laughs> that's the other question. What's up and with that? That's what's up with that? And is that related to the, the um, mythical green flash that we hear about in Pirates of the Caribbean and occasionally in the real world? I don't think it's related to the green flash. That's a weird atmospheric thing. Uh, but why is it green? It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that that's the peak wavelength from the sun. It has more to do with atmospheric scattering. I think so. Okay. But but it's a fun I, question. Like why when you look at the sun, why does it appear yellowish and not green? But yeah. that partly our 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 eye responses. Yeah, it's partly our eye response. And also, and, and also it's an integrated sun, response. Right. So the sun produces uh, you know, a huge amount a huge amount of light over across the entire visible spectrum. So the the peak may be in the green, but it's not like strongly peaked in the green. Right, and it probably says something about, like what Addie was saying, that our, the, the sensors in our eyes are not like the way a scientist or an astronomer would design wavelength sensors in terms of the different wavelengths that they can see. Like two of them are very, very close together in terms of what wavelength or color of light tickles them. Hmm. Is it, uh, the rods or the cones, I always get them mixed up. But uh, anyway, that just talking about sunspots and the darkness of sunspots against the rest of the sky. We'll talk about this, the sun in a little bit more detail. It's one of our science topics is how active or inactive the sun is and what the meanings of that may be, as well as uh, the grand structure of the universe. Um, but there's a lot of space news. There is. All sorts of space news, uh, mostly related to human space travel recently. Very uh, exciting. Yeah. So in it also, I should point out, Another episode of Walk About the Galaxy means time to announce another launch of 60 Starlink satellites. <laughs> I believe the next launch of that is scheduled for next week, May 7th uh, of 2020. 60 more satellites, which will bring their total up close to 500 in orbit. So that oh, more than 10% more than of all the satellites up there will be these Starlink satellites. Crazy. So that's coming up, and then at the end of May is, in principle, what's called Demo 2. Yeah, there was a big press conference today, as we're recording, um, with uh, about Demo 2. Um, so it had the two guys um, who were going to fly on... What company? NASA. SpaceX is the provider of the rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, SpaceX, it's a SpaceX rocket, so it's Crew Dragon. Um, and this is the demo where they're actually going to fly two astronauts from Kennedy Space Center to the space station. It'll be very exciting. It'll be the first time since, what, 2011? I think it's funny they call it Demo 2. It's kind of like, here's a demonstration of how we would fly astronauts to the space station. And it's like, yeah. well, you just actually didn't. You just flew <laughs> astronauts the real to the thing. space station. Yeah. It's sort of a weird, it, yeah, it's sort of a weird name for it. Um, the, so yeah, so it's Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley. Um, it's supposed to launch on May 27th, but they had a press conference today just with the astronauts talking about and talking about the sort of schedule and st what's still going to happen um, before the launch. So there's still a couple of tests they have to do. Um, and the astronauts are going to have to go into their sort of normal quarantine, uh, I think on like May 16th. Um, 
so that they and they've always done this for astronauts where astronauts get quarantined before uh, they launch just because you don't want them getting a, I don't know, do a they, little sniffle before they, they go to the space together, station. together or do they quarantine sep individually? Uh, it's like most, I think it's a lot of it's together. They used to have like a beach house and then there's like specific quarantine oh, facilities sweet. at Kennedy also. Um, and it's, so it's like, I think it's usually as a group. Yeah. Sniffle would be one thing, but like uh, explosive diarrhea would be maybe a different <laughs> story. So, there was yeah right during the in the Apollo 13 uh mission they make a big deal of um of it in the movie especially uh because in the Apollo 13 mission one of the guys who was supposed Fred to fly Hayes, I think. oh Fred yeah Hayes one guy got had, sick well he they thought he was going to get sick but then he never ended up getting sick but one of the guys on uh the mission did get sick so it was like oops <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, um yeah not it's you know how it's no fun to be sick when you're away from home i yeah, think that I got that's an airplane like, flight even <laughs> yeah i think that's like you can amp that up significantly if you're in a rocket or on yeah. the space station <laughs> for yeah. six months yeah, or yeah, something yeah. feeling yeah. a little bit yeah. under the weather for yeah. very under the weather so that's yeah. cool there's other human space flight news though you're talking about eddie yeah and then the other big news is that they just announced um uh, awards for three companies to um develop lunar further develop lunar landers so they just did this yes the announcements were yesterday um but the so this is the idea that nasa is doing a very um segmented approach to the next lunar missions um and it's not that nasa is going to build everything themselves or even set the design specifications for everything which is what they've done in the past right nasa didn't actually build a lot of the parts of the of the lunar module before but they specified everything and they worked really closely with the companies to design it and this time they're saying we're going to contract and purchase basically these things and they still have to meet requirements and safety guidelines and things like that and do demonstrations as we've talked about for nasa but it's actually like purchasing a, a product from a company a little bit more than they've done in the past and so they're doing this with various parts of this lunar architecture and it's still basically that sls is going to launch the astronauts for artemis um which are the first lunar missions um, sls is the space launch system which is the new nasa, NASA. u.s government heavy launch vehicle yes uh, that's got some has some sort of heritage from the space shuttle system yeah. it's got big solid rocket motors even bigger than the ones in the shuttle and then it uses mm -hmm some variant or descendant, I think, of the shuttle main engines as well. But instead yeah, of carrying a little, giant shuttle, it carries this little tiny Orion capsule. Yeah, yeah. So most of the engines and things like that on SLS are heritage, have a lot of heritage in flight already. Um, and it's flying the Orion capsule. And then the idea is the astronauts would launch on that, go rendezvous near the moon, and then have one of these companies um, get hop on their lunar lander and descend to the surface. It's a little bit different for SpaceX. So the three companies are, um, so Blue Origin is leading what they're calling their national team. So it actually has a bunch of other companies as part of that, including like Lockheed Martin and ULA, uh, or and Bremen, a couple of other I things. Hmm? I think Northrop Grumman is one there. Me, yeah. In the Blue Origin team. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's a big um, conglomeration of people. And then they would use, um, a ULA rocket to launch, I believe. Um, and they, so they have their lunar lander, Blue Moon. Um, and then uh, the other uh, companies that were selected were SpaceX. So a, a version, a variant of the Starship um, would go. And so they I think they would actually like launch themselves, obviously, and land. Um, and then the other one is a company called, and I keep messing it up. Dynetics, I think. Dynetics. Not yeah. to be confused with Dianetics. <laughs> right. Yes, which so is Elrond, a different. Elrond still killing it. Nice. Yeah. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> very different thing, I think. I hope it's a very different thing. Yes. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty cool because all the architectures are very different. Um, the funding they announced is just a, like a ten-month funding, so to help them develop. Um, their facilities or their vehicles and so that's what they've been doing for um the, a lot of the contracts nasa's been doing recently um they're just so these pick one of these three hmm? they're just going to pick one of these three in the end 
probably i don't know what they've done with a lot of the commercial crew stuff right is they've had a couple that have been continuing to get funding so but usually with these contracts it's like they have to demonstrate something by the end of it to get con to, to continue any sort of funding yeah and i could imagine that they might uh do some rearranging or forced marriages or something like that between various elements of them because a lot of them are these sort of multi-component, multi-element things like this company is making the lander, but this other company is making the part that takes you up from the surface of the moon back to lunar orbit. And then this part is handling some other things. So, uh, so yeah. but basically these three teams have money from NASA to work for 10 months to sort of flesh out their plans and designs. And then NASA in principle will review those and then make some decision about what happens next. Yeah. Yep. So 10 months so takes exciting. us into 2021. Uh, so what's, what are your uh, bets on the odds that people will be walking on the moon by the end of 2024? Silence. I mean, so, so there was an interesting, right? There was a good question during the press conference for this, which was like, uh, the last time NASA did this back in the 60s, right, it, they gave the first contracts at some date and then it was like six years later, or eight years later or something right before there was actually any hardware and, and, and actually landing. But there's a big difference this time, which is that we have had experience with a lot more space flight at this point, right, and all of these companies that are working on these things have a lot more heritage in the things that they're building, not necessarily for being on the moon specifically, but like for space flight and for other aspects of it um so and the fact that nasa is contracting out this time instead of driving everything where they're they have to come back and forth as much i think would will expedite it the big questions right are like if we'll have the launch vehicles if we, even if we have a lander if we'll have the launch vehicles to be able to do it and get there so i think those are going to drive it maybe more than the landers but mm -hmm. i don't know yeah one of the uh, launch vehicles that's under development that I, I know we're all excited to see take off just for the show of it, if for nothing else, is the new Glenn uh, reusable orbital launch vehicle that's being developed by Blue Origin. And don't know exactly when that is, but they're talking like maybe late 2021, early 2022, hopefully within two years. So that'll be, that's a big, physically very large rocket. It's not more powerful than the Falcon Heavy, but it's physically larger. It's close to the size of the Saturn V, just sort of in its dimensions. And so mm -hmm. uh, that'll be exciting to see. So exciting space news yeah, all around. Um, well, let's talk about this new study about the sun. Since uh, we had our sponsor message from Sunspots and we have <laughs> frequently talked about exoplanets and the so-called habitable zone and prospects for life around other star on planets around other stars in our galaxy and have talked a lot about the role that the star plays in determining the habitable zone not just in terms of whether or not the temperature on the planet is nice but whether the star is temperamental mm -hmm. and has lots of flares and things like that so um uh, this new study seems to say that maybe the sun is unusually quiescent or calm, mild-mannered. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we uh, we do as astronomers or is to say that, well, the sun is sort of a typical mean sequence middle-aged star, right? So there's lots of other stars like it, and it, it sort of represents what these other ones are doing. And we do that because we know that there are other objects, other stars like it, in uh, the universe, um, and but this is the one that we can study the closest, and so we make a lot of assumptions that like other stars must be exactly like this. But as we've had more and more data from things like Kepler, even um, and other telescopes, it's like okay, well, how how does it compare to some of these others? Um, I love I love the one of the lines from uh, one of the authors of the uh, paper, um, Timo Reinhold, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. It's like, is the sun? actually a sun-like star because yeah. uh, <laughs> we're always talking about like oh it's a sun-like star it's like maybe the sun isn't even a sun-like star <laughs> yeah maybe it's a, i mean it is but <laughs> <laughs> but we've been using sunlight to mean a typical that there are a lot yeah. of stars like it right and maybe yeah. it's atypical um which comes back to also we've been talking about whether or not our 
planetary system is typical or not. We sort of like to write the textbooks. It's like, oh, here you're always going to, if you read an Astronomy 101 textbook, you'll always end up with some uh, well-spaced rocky planets close to the star and then some well-spaced big gaseous planets with a lot of moons very far away from the star. Maybe not. Yeah. Certainly we see lots of things that are very different than that. Yeah. So, and so, we talked, um, I think on the last episode, we mentioned that there's a new um, sunspot cycle starting um, as well. So there's a lot more activity on the sun right now, but even, even then it's still relatively quiet. And we're not just talking about sunspots here. So this study looked at sort of overall the activity of the sun, like the magnetic activity and things like that. Um, and just that it seems to be a little bit more quiet than other stars uh, that are sort of the same uh, age and um, type, right, as our sun. And so, um, so they looked at several like hundred, other right? stars. Let's say again. They looked at several hundred other stars, sort of yeah. nominally like the sun. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that they have a lot more magnetic activity than our star. So one, I think one thing we said said five times as much magnetic activity. Um, so that just means they're much more active. And we know the sun used to be active very early on in when it was younger. It was more temperamental. Um, and stars do tend to become a little bit more quiescent as they age. Um, and there's some stage at which the, the sun will become much more quiet. So it sort of hits, I don't know, menopause or older age or something like that, right? And it's much quieter at that point. Um, and so it's possible that our sun is actually already sort of starting to go into that period. We thought it probably wasn't happening yet, but there, I mean, it's a range of when that actually happens. Um, so it's like, it's like waiting for Beetlejuice to blow up. Could be tomorrow, <laughs> could be in half a million years or something. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So this is kind of uh, existentially bad news for us, right? And not for us specifically, but for for our outlook on the universe, right? Because when we talk about habitabil habitability, a quiescent star is important, right? Because if it, you have an active star, that means occasionally all the planets will get bathed in high energy uh, uh, charged particles, and you'll have changes in luminosity within the star, which will cause drastic changes in the, in the atmosphere, in the environment, and these things are generally not good for uh, for life, so this kind of thing worries me just because <laughs> I want there to be life all over the place out there, and there probably is, I feel like, but uh, this, the sun no, being special rather than not so special is concerning. We know yeah. there are Vulcans and Klingons and Romulans. Right, I mean, obviously there are those. Right. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, no, yeah I, I mean, there are two hypotheses that the authors have, right, which is that maybe it's just unusually quiet right now, um, that the sun is just sort of quiet, right? We know there are periods in history when it's been very quiet, um, but it's not, um, it doesn't seem like, it seems like it's been quiet for a while. Uh, and so it, it might just be sort of a, a local minimum. It's just quiet for sort of our observation periods and things like that. And it's even like 10,000 years of ice core observations is a small amount of time compared to the lifetime of the sun, right? So it could just be that it's relatively quiet right now. Um, it's in between tantrums or something, right? Or it could be that we're sort of in this older age and we're transitioning um, to being an older age star. So they're both a little bit kind of downer negative to refer back to your stumper answers uh, scenarios because as Jim says I, I also get absurdly and disproportionately depressed at the idea that there may not be fleets of Vulcan ships cruising around the galaxy and so anytime there's some news that sort of indicates that maybe nice uh, habitable planets uh, like the earth are not as common I find that to be a real downer but then uh, the alternative to that, Eddie, what you were just saying is if the sun is just happens to sort of temporarily be in a down state, then that says, okay, well, maybe there's life on those other planets, but it means that when the sun comes out of its down state, it's going to be solar flares and coronal mass ejections, and it's going to fry all our satellites and screw up our electrical grid and all yeah. that. So, uh, you know, of course, that might not happen for another million years, in which case, you know, I have less concern about it, frankly. My, <laughs> I, I, I admit to a little bit of a, a short-term thinking or, uh, 
you know, windowed or blinded horizon in that regard. Jeez, but, you're only thinking on like a 10,000 year time frame, Josh. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think I got a shot at making it to 10,000, but 100,000, yeah. I don't know. It's not as realistic. It's not as realistic for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they looked at uh, almost 400 other stars. And then as you said, they, they kind of tried to go back as far as they could in uh, our record keeping to see what they could see about the sun and don't see any evidence that like right now is different than it was 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. But this is a good yeah. segue to our trivia. Oh, oh we're because ready. Because the, tr the trivia is also solar re related. Okay. Perfect. And uh, you were mentioning that there have been quiet times in the sun's activity that we know about. And you've also uh, mentioned that we're beginning a new solar cycle, this sort of 11 year period. And one of the most obvious markers of that are this number of sunspots, these dark mm -hmm. spots uh, in the, on the surface of the sun. And um, so one simple measure of like how active the sun is just counting those sunspots, like at the sun with the appropriate protection, the appropriate telescope, and just see how many sunspots you see. So now they're starting mm -hmm. to tick up again. But there was a period um, in the latter half of the 17th century called the Maunder Minimum, where there were virtually no sunspots recorded for 50 or 60 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. The 20th century, in terms of the, over the course of the last four or 500 years of uh, telescopic observations, 400 years, the 20th century has been a little bit more active up until maybe the end of the 20th century. The last 10 or 20 years has been kind of low. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, your question is going to be about the most number of sunspots ever observed. And I have okay. to, I have to um, place at a one big, time or in a year. At one time, like okay. at one time on a day. And the caveat on this, because I was doing a lot of research, and is like counting sunspots is not as uh, objective and precise an activity as say counting the number of Hubble stamps in Jim Cooney's stamp collection. Correct. Or, get those notebooks out. You could just go through them and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Um, maybe that should have been, that'll be, Jim can ask us that trivia question. How many Hubble Space Telescope stamps does he have? <laughs> but uh, so there's all these sort of different fudge factors on it and if there are different sort of definitions of sunspot number. Okay. Yeah, I was reading about that so, the other day actually. Yeah. yeah what so, I was gonna say is, yeah, when you look at sunspots, the closer in you look at them, they're not like, yeah, individual. They're like multiple little blobs and things like that. So how are you defining a sunspot? Right. Um, it's sort of like how many crumbs are there on the table? It's like, well, if I look really closely at this crumb, it's two crumbs stuck together or something. Right. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, nevertheless, it doesn't stop people from making a list of these numbers. <laughs> okay. And I looked at a list. I looked at a list of the international sunspot number and found the biggest one. <laughs> on that list <laughs> and i'm going to give you multiple choice for it okay okay most numbers uh most sense uh, the highest international sunspot number 354 472 504 690 and 913. these are a number of sunspots on one i was going to go if you would not given us multiple choice i was going to go with a much smaller number <laughs> Those aren't, so is that sun, like international sunspot number or is that? That's international sunspot number. Okay, so that, so I was reading about that earlier, so maybe I have a. You should, a, you can uh, correct or cheater. edit my, cheating. my trivia. I cannot oh, believe I'm cheating on accident. I told, there was a... you, I told you this was international sunspot number and this is what I, best I could, go ahead. Addie. Yeah, yeah, no, so international sunspot number, you usually divide by like three or something to get the sort of number you would see if you looked at the disc. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, okay. Okay. Jim, just so you okay. feel better about okay. it. All right. I, I still yeah. feel like you're a cheater, but that's okay. I'll go with it. Who's I was cheating? earlier because I was looking <laughs> oh. at space weather. She's cheating because she's educated? <laughs> that's correct. She knows more than I do about this. Therefore, she's therefore cheating. She's cheating. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there will be a follow up. There will be a follow up question at the end about how big was the largest sunspot ever seen. Hmm. Okay. okay. But uh, yeah, so now let's let's uh, zoom out to the large scale structure of the universe. Ooh, I love That's doing that. Yeah. 
the big it. picture. The it's big like picture. the powers of ten video. No, we yes. don't. To go all the way out. And that's Which order uh, of magnitude uh, are we on? That's the kind of uh, physics and astronomy that I love the best is the large scale structure of the universe. Um, but I was reading an article earlier uh, about our understanding of that because it's actually, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, we have a pretty good picture of what the universe looked like when it was very young. And that picture is of course the, uh, the cosmic microwave background when we uh, look at a picture of the cosmic microwave background, which is this background radiation coming to us from all directions that originated uh, when the universe was about 300,000 years old. When we map that out, look at how it looks over the entire sky, we have a beautiful picture of what the universe looked like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And we have a pretty good picture of what the universe looks like now. We just go out and look at the distribution of galaxies. You know, we see they're clustered together into clusters and the clusters are kind of arranged in these super clusters and the super clusters are arranged in this beautiful like filamentary soap bubbly pattern. So what did it look like 300, uh, 300 after the, you so said we can see what it looks like right after the Big Bang. What did it look like then? Right, so then it, it just looks like this mottled hot. pattern of hot and cold spots in this radiation. And the, the, the kind of cold spots will end up being uh, the seeds for the formation of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and so forth. But it's, a, it's this kind of randomly distributed pattern of, of hot and cold patterns on various size scales. And so- Kind of like the sun. Kind of like the sun, yeah. It's, it actually it looks a lot like that image behind you right now. I know that most of our listeners can't see that because you're listening and not looking. Our, all of our listeners can't see it, but all our, watchers can, well, our watchers will be able to see it on YouTube. And uh, watchers are also listening. Yeah, but that kind of filamentary Maybe. pattern is, is anyway. Uh, the question is, how do you go from where we started to where we ended? Uh, how did the stuff, the uh, structure in the universe, evolve from its beginnings to the end? And we work hard trying to write down equations. You know, kind of trying to come up with analytic expressions for here's how you go evolve the universe from the beginning to the end. But it turns out to be very challenging because uh when it, it actually it's easy at the beginning you can start out with this g generally uh fairly uniform but modeled little thing and you can start to make structure that is we can write down equations for how it starts but then when it gets really going it becomes very difficult because things become as we say in mathematics and physics non-linear uh, so the, 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 but the challenge of the task here is how you get from a sort of smooth uniform mushy thing to a lumpy, stringy, clumpy thing. Exactly, exactly. And so the, 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 the details of how you start that is pretty easy. The details of how you get from kind of the, the, the teenage years to uh, maturity is very, very challenging. And the uh, cool thing is that we're starting Just to like get Just like in real life. <laughs> I know it, I know it. Uh, but we're starting to get a handle. I mean, and this was one of the things that, that uh, I actually had worked on partially as uh, as part of my PhD work and so forth, is trying to understand uh, this this kind of transition from nice, easy flow of stuff. And we use these very simple equations that are the same equations that people that st study the flow of fluids use. Is, think is of it a fluid G, on the largest scales? Is it G equals eight pi RT? <laughs> it's, uh, it's something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, those then things it gets are easy, crazy. But then, and then, but then, once 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 the structure starts to collapse down, when things go non-linear, then things become very very difficult. And if if any of our uh, listeners are mathematicians out there, they know that non-linear equations are essentially impossible to solve analytically. But uh, we now have some theoretical framework for doing that, and uh, we can compare that to all of these observations of the structure of the universe. Uh, and the beautiful thing is, it matches, right? So the the analytic uh, expressions, what we get out of that match what we actually see in the universe now and in the past. And that's awesome because what that means is our big general concept of how the universe works is working still, right? So even, even <laughs> your regime. Yay, us. Still working. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, a, right? To have we need a, a podcast sound idea. effect. It's like, we did it. Woo! 
right? It is, it's great to, I mean, we live at one tiny point in, in time and a tiny point in space here, and yet we're able to build a pretty solid model for how the entire universe has evolved from the beginning to now. I thought you is, said it was a fluid model, not a solid model. Oh, <laughs> snap. Ouch. Yeah. A uh, pretty solid fluid model <laughs> of <laughs> how the universe has evolved. And so, so to people like me that study the structure of the universe, this is really uh, a, a happy day. Was there some sort of Maybe. like, what was the breakthrough? Was somebody breakthrough did a, was, a light bulb go off over somebody's head or did a, uh, a new computer get built or what? There was no, no observations. I mean, we have, uh, and that's, that's what we've been doing for a long time is just using big, bigger and bigger computers and running more and more complicated simulations of what's happening. But that doesn't really, it still doesn't really get at the, uh, at the, fun, the, the fundamentals of it. So we needed an analytical approach. So the, the kind of new thing here was a new analytical approach to how you go from uh, the, the easy part at the beginning to the hard uh, nonlinear part at the end. And so people are starting to be able to tackle that, uh, those nonlinear uh, bits analytically and that matching the actual observations is pretty awesome. Yeah, so and the observations were, um, this big giant survey that they looked at, right? Lots and hundreds of galaxies and sort of their distributions and oh yeah, way more than hundreds of galaxies. Move. You know, thousands, thousands. And thousands and thousands of galaxies and looking at their their distribution in you know in in fine detail and seeing how they're distributed. And when the when you write out the equations and say the universe should look roughly like this, and then you go out and look at the universe and it looks roughly like that, that's pretty awesome. That, that's when you pop the champagne corks. Yeah, you say we're we're, we're on to something. We, you know, we don't understand all the details, but there are but the big picture is pretty well worked out, and that's kind of awesome. Right. Yeah. So these are these are equations that say they don't say oh you'll get you'll get a planet Earth around a star right. soul in the Milky Way galaxy with three cool people doing a podcast, but it will say the distribution of matter on these very large scales will have a certain clumpiness and sparsity or whatever. Right. Sure. That's not a word. Right. Right. So yeah, you're not you're not modeling exactly what it's going to look like, but you're going to model like the kind of all of the statistical properties of it look like. Like, if I made a box this big, on average, I'm going to have this many galaxies in it, and they're going to be distributed mm -hmm. this way, and that is what matches the observations. Cool. So you're celebrating. I'm celebrating. Hey. Good day Great. for large scale structure. All right. Well, it's time to bring you down, since oh. you chose down. I did choose. Uh, oh. By coming back to the uh, to your trivia. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Which I've already which, admitted I would have gotten horribly which, wrong without the, uh, <laughs> right. without the multiple which, choice. Which, uh, well, I felt that because of all these issues with the sunspot numbers and everything like that, uh, yeah. I thought it was, uh, it would have been ridiculous to just have you pick a number out of the blue, um, or out of the orange. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jim, do you want to go first? Your choices are uh, 354, 472, 504, 690, or 913 for the highest international sunspot number that Josh Caldwell found on some list. 472. I'm still, I think I'm going to go with the, the smallest one, the three something something. Addie wins. Oh. Addie wins again. It is. <laughs> that wasn't it even because I was cheating necessarily. Yeah. It is 354. I was trying to do a little bit of psycho thing because usually in multiple choice, I don't you, put the correct answer do. first. <laughs> you are a little psycho. It's fine. A little psycho. Uh, any guesses yeah. as to when that might have been? Which day or month or year or decade or century? 1942. Oh, very close. 1948. 48. Wow. Yeah. Domination. So 46, 47, 48 was a big solar When was the Carrington period. event? That was in the twenties, I think, oh. or the nine or the eighteen nineties or something. What's the Carrington uh, event? I think I know. But I'm when was it? Know. Maybe I don't remember. I don't know. I'll have to Google it. I don't remember. The Carrington event was some big coronal mass ejection that dumped a whole bunch of stuff out of the sun, which caused it was like the like biggest one we'd had since. Out. Yeah, and it was the biggest one course. we'd had since we had like technology, and so it fried all sorts of electrical grids and stuff like right. that too. Right. So if, if the sun is currently in a sort of unusually dormant state, we might have more sort of Carrington event-like things in our future. But if the sun is going into menopause, where the internal magnetic thing is sort of shutting down, then we would have fewer, or maybe no more Carrington event type 
Oh yeah, that was in 1859. Why did I guess the 40s then? I think I just randomly guessed that. I don't know, but good job. Right. Nice. Yeah, May 11th, 1948. Uh, okay, your follow-up question is, how okay. big was the largest sunspot group ever observed? And the units that they reported this in for what I found were really stupid. So I'm gonna give you, uh, give it in terms of the total surface area of the planet Earth. So okay. fractions or multiples of the total surface area of the planet Earth. And I don't have choices for you on this one, but the units oh. is a clue. It's not going to be like 10 million of those or a millionth. Uh, eight times. 42 times. Uh, logarithmically right in between you, but we'll give it to Jim. 18 times the total surface area of the Earth. <laughs> Uh, that was in that same solar cycle period, 1947 is when it was observed. And the units that they reported in is in like millionths of the solar disk. Oh, well, that makes hmm. sense. Whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, hopefully I admitted my math. One of the things right that I was, I remember when I was looking at sunspot stuff earlier, the, I think the units, so the units we use for like the solar um, flux, so like how uh, like how much energy is coming from it are usually in like um, a lot of times we do in terms of specific like actual physical energy units, but I think a lot of times um, the flux is reported in solar flux units. Oh, right. The, that's the abbreviation for is SFU. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> anyway. I San Francisco I, I University. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Shut well, front door. Yeah. <laughs> While it may have felt like a full solar cycle, it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you like this episode of Walk About the Galaxy, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Look, just give us five stars. If everyone <laughs> gives us five stars, then we'll go viral and you'll see us on The Daily Show or Colbert or Kimmel, and you'll be able to say, I made that happen. Yes. Do you it. You wield incredible power. power be sure to like us on facebook get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com subscribe to our youtube channel walk about the galaxy where eventually you will be able to see addy dove's close-up solar convection cell backdrop from this episode gurgling and burbling that's the sounds the sun makes gurgles and burbles <laughs> uh, Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag walk about the galaxy. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik. Production assistance is provided by Diego Rodriguez. Jillian Gloria is director of marketing. Thanks to our listeners in Ireland and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astro Quarks, signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Sunspots. <laughs>